Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Jen and I'm here in hot, sunny central Florida and today we're talking everything you want to know about winter and summer squashes. Today is April 18th and it's one of my last chances to get seeds planted for these squashes before it gets too hot for me to deal with them. I'll be talking all about seed starting, timing, pest and disease management, and even some harvesting. If you're ready to learn about this, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and let's get into it. For starters, there's two different categories of squashes, and that's summer squash and winter squash. Summer squash is like your yellow squash or your zucchini, and it has a thin edible skin and it usually grows in a bush formation. Winter squash has a hard, inedible exterior which helps it last a lot longer in storage. Winter squash is what typically grows in a vining way. One of the key things about growing squashes is getting your timing right. Here in Central Florida, my time for planting these squashes is either August through September or January through April. Today is April 19th, so it's one of my last chances to get seeds done. I've already got some in the, in the garden, which I'll show you in a minute, but I wanted to get another round as a preventative or a backup measure in case something happens like pests or diseases happens to mine in the garden. Today we're gonna sow seeds for all three of these types. I've got a yellow squash, a zucchini, and a spaghetti squash. And each one has to be planted about one half inch to one inch in depth. I've got this seed starting cell right here. This is my Vigo Garden seed starting cell, the standard size, which I love. I've already got some starts going for other things. Today I'm just using this one cell. So I'm gonna do three of the yellow squashes, two spaghetti squashes, and three zucchinis. Let's start with Black Beauty Summer Squash. I picked this variety because um, I'm here in Central Florida and I looked at my Ag Extension website and they recommended the Black Beauty variety for zucchini. The reason they recommended that one is because it's heat tolerant and also somewhat resistant to powdery mildew. So we'll give it a shot. The last time I tried to grow this um, zucchini was an utter failure. <laughs> I didn't get anything to pollinate. But we'll talk about pollination later and some of the changes that I'm going to do this season to improve my results. All right, we've got the green squash in there. Let's go with the yellow squash. This is the early prolific straight neck from Botanical Interests. Again, I'm going to plant it one seed per hole about an inch deep, an inch down. Um, oops, whoops. Every, I swear, every time I do seed starting on camera, I drop seeds all over the place. <laughs> Maybe I'll get better over time. Just, right now I'm just making a hole about one inch deep for all three of them. One, two, three. And now we'll do spaghetti squash, but it looks like all my seeds have spilled out into my container. So um, there's nothing left in the envelope. I'll poke a hole another inch deep. I have such fond memories of um, spaghetti squash because I think I was uh, maybe like 13 or so when I first learned about spaghetti squash. And I think it was because my mom was always trying to get me and my brother and my sister to eat more vegetables. And we woke up one morning and she fed us pancakes and we loved them, but they were a little bit different. <laughs> and when we asked why, she said they were spaghetti squash pancakes. <laughs> and I mean, we were all flabbergasted, obviously, but they were so good. If you've never tried spaghetti squash pancakes, I'll have to get my mom to comment on the video and, and put the recipe in there for you guys to try. Give it a shot, it's really good. It's a good way to sneak in veggies for your kids. I just covered them the seeds up with some soil. Now we're gonna put that humidity dome on top. My soil is already nice and moist, but I'm gonna go ahead and add some more into the top of this just to get those seeds started. And there you have it, we started our seeds. Let's go out to the garden and talk about what it's gonna look like in a few short weeks. Right here, I've got a yellow squash that's just a few weeks old, and you'll notice it's right next to my um, cattle panel trellis against my fence, so I can use it as support as it grows. 
Support is so important for squash plants. The bush types will get so big and actually pretty tall, they're gonna need some sort of pole or trellis to lean against so that they can support that heavy fruit that they're growing. The vining type, you're gonna want to keep good airflow between all the leaves to help prevent some of the pests and diseases that you're gonna see. You can train those vining squashes to grow up and down. You can use plant clips to help attach it to the trellis. That's really gonna help your leaves dry out after a rain and it's really gonna help that airflow between the leaves to keep the plant healthy. Another option for the vining variety could be just to let it sprawl, but that usually for backyard gardeners like me, we're limited by space and vining isn't necessarily a good option because that takes up so much more space in our bed and we can't grow any of the other vegetables that we'd like to grow. Let me turn the camera around and I'll show you a cucumber plant that I'm growing right now, which is a vining type, just so I can show how it will grow along a trellis. Right here are two cucumber plants growing and you can see the tendrils have attached themselves. I kind of pointed them in that direction um, and they're actually attaching to the trellis on their own. One of the primary things that you have to get right with growing squashes is pollination. There's gonna be both male and female flowers. I'm gonna insert an old clip from another video that I did a few months ago that actually shows a male and a female flower from a pumpkin plant really well. Right here you can see this is a female flower because we have this baby pumpkin right here. Right here you can see this is a female flower because we have this baby pumpkin right here. And it's open ready to be pollinated. So the inside of a female pumpkin flower looks quite a bit different than the inside of, as an example, a male flower. The plant will grow both male and female flowers. The female flower is the one that has a small fruit below the flower. So like a small zucchini or a small squash or a small um, watermelon or something like that. The way that it works naturally is that a bee will go and get the pollen from the male flower and then go and pollinate the female flower and then you'll get your fruit set. However, if you don't have good insect populations where you are or you're not drawing the bees to your garden, you may need to hand pollinate those. So I'm going to insert a link to that video that explains how to do the hand pollination, but essentially what you can do is cut off that male flower, cut off the petals around it to expose that anther, and take that anther and touch the stigma of the female flower, and that will pollinate it. Wind does not pollinate squash flowers, so don't rely on the wind. A way that you can encourage the bees to visit your garden um, to help this happen naturally is by interplanting some flowers like nasturtium or borage or marigolds next to your flowering squashes. Right near my yellow squash right here, I have some nasturtiums. The same concept is applied here where I have marigolds planted right next to my cucumber plants. Something that you're going to need to figure out during this growing cycle of squashes is how to properly provide for the nutrients for those plants. I've read through this book, Leaves, Roots, and Fruits by Nicole Johnsey Burke, and I recommend it for learning the basics of a small fruiting plant such as zucchini or yellow squash or even spaghetti squash. Basically, you can think of the plant growth as happening in three different stages that, and it needs plant nutrients and food along the way that supports the, that different part of the life cycle. The first part is growing leaves. You can encourage growth of leaves by adding nitrogen-rich fertilizer or plant food. I've got some blood meal coming in the mail today, so I'm definitely going to amend my soil for my new seedlings with a little bit of blood meal. After that, I'm going to reach for a potassium-rich mixture to help those roots grow big and deeper. That I will use that potassium-rich formula probably until I see flowers. Once I see flowers, from that point on till harvest, I know after reading this book that the plant is in need of phosphorus. So what I'm gonna do is switch the plant food formula or however you wanna do it with a fertilizer, a synthetic, organic, or just amending the soil with some sort of manure or compost mixture. You're gonna to want to find something that is phosphorus rich. That's the third letter. So you've got your NPK when you're looking at fertilizers or plant food, and that's nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. 
It doesn't mean that it should only have that one nutrient, but at the different phases of growth, it should have the highest number in those respective areas. So when it's growing leaves at the very beginning, you're gonna want something that has the highest first number, so N, nitrogen. In that second stage where it's, you want it to grow big roots and get ready to produce flowers, that's when you want the biggest second number. And then in that third phase between flowering and harvesting, that's when you're gonna want phosphorus rich mixture. So that K needs to be the highest number of the mixture that you're using. The last time I tried to grow zucchini, it wasn't really that long ago, but the plant was alive for months and months and months and it just never even set fruit. So what happened was I would see these small fruits, I would see these small zucchinis with the female flowers on them and then I guess it never got pollinated because they would like just look squishy and black and they would just fall off. And uh, so what I think happened is that it was just poor pollination and I should have tried hand pollination. Um, but I never ended up doing it and so I just pulled the plant because it started getting overtaken by powdery mildew and I couldn't fight against it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> this I'm gonna try again this season and see if I can get some zucchini and I'm gonna be watching it like a hawk for hand pollination opportunities to make sure I can get pollinated zucchinis. If you've ever failed at growing squash, let me know in the comments because I feel so alone. Zucchini is one of those things on the internet that, uh, I mean, they make memes about how easy it is to grow zucchini, I feel like. They have that meme that says like, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a woman to garden, the whole neighborhood gets zucchini. And I'm over here, I can't even grow a zucchini. <laughs> so I'm gonna prove myself wrong and get it right this, this time. And the way I'm gonna do it is by amending my soil to keep the nutrients really high and also watching out for hand pollination opportunities so I don't get the fruit drop that comes with poor pollination. Let's talk about some of the pests and diseases that you might come across when growing some squashes. For me, here in humid central Florida, it's all about powdery mildew. And there's only so much you can do once you get it. Powdery mildew is a fungus and it's, it's white. It just starts to put like a white webbing on the leaves. So it's really easy to identify actually. Basically it kills the plant because that white fungus will cover the leaves and inhibit its ability to get energy from the sun. So we have to try to prevent it, number one, and then once we get it, we have to try to manage it. So to try to prevent it, a couple things you're gonna do is number one, pick resistant varieties. That's why I'm choosing early prolific straight neck yellow squash. My local extension office recommends that one as um, a somewhat powdery mildew resistant variety. Same with black beauty, zucchini, and spaghetti squash, although that doesn't mean it's not gonna get it. It just means that maybe it won't get it quite as quickly as some other varieties. Other things you can do is trellis or support your plant so that it gets proper airflow and it's not sitting there with wet leaves over time. Wet leaves are a prime environment for powdery mildew. That's why we're so susceptible to it is because we get these heavy afternoon rains in the warm season and then it can't dry because it's so humid and it just, promotes the growth of this fungus. Once we get it, one of your options is gonna be to prune, prune off those leaves as soon as you see it. A mistake I've made in the past about pruning the leaves is not feeding the soil adequately afterwards. And by that, I mean you have to give the plant enough nitrogen to reproduce new leaves after you just pruned a whole bunch off for powdery mildew if you want your plant to survive. So keep the soil nutrients high prune the leaves, and that's one method of going about it. That's something I'm gonna do this year. Another method is going to be, a, once you see it, you need to be spraying um, periodically in the evening so it doesn't burn the leaves. Spray in the evening with a baking soda, dish soap, and water mixture, and that should help. But it, honestly, it's really hard to fight. You have to be really consistent about spraying it at night. Do not do it in the evening. The leaves will burn. You'll just end up with brown leaves, and you might as well just prune the leaves. Squash leaves, I've noticed, are very sensitive to stuff that you spray on them. I've totally destroyed a plant before by spraying neem oil in the middle of the afternoon, so don't do that. There are some products out there like neem oil that you could spray to try to help with um, powdery mildew, but just be careful spraying when it's in that flowering stage because some of those products, you'll want to read about them to be sure, but some of those products actually can harm 
bees and you don't want to harm your bee population. We want to keep our bee population high. So spray at night when the bees are mostly inactive. The last thing you can do to help yourself out when it comes to powdery mildew is having a backup plant. That's why I started buying seed starting cells and trays. I want to have a spare plant ready to go that's not too far behind. So whenever I have a plant that's just dying from powdery mildew, I can pull it up and I can transplant a new one in and I'm not that far away from harvesting again. It's so hot out there by the garden, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even sit out there and film. I'm just sitting there sweating. <laughs> so. I wanted to talk about the squash vine borer, the most common pest you're going to see on a common pest you're going to see on winter and summer squashes. It's a vine borer. So the way that it shows up is basically you'll see at the very base of the stem where it meets the soil, you'll see some eggs and then the larva will actually eat into the stem and ruin the plant and kill the plant from the inside out. Keep an eye on that, especially in the beginning of the plant's life, to try to keep the squash vine borer away. If you actually see the squash vine borer, some of the ways you can get rid of it is actually using tape to try to manually remove the eggs. Um, you can also spray BT, something like BT, but this is another reason why you may want to have a backup plant in a seed, cell, seed starting cell, because once you get squash vine borers, it's really hard to get rid of squash vine borers. Let's talk about harvesting. Once your plant is producing fruit, you're gonna want to frequently harvest. Harvesting often is one of the best signals you can give to the plant to keep producing more fruit. So what you're gonna do when the fruit is about the right size for harvesting, you're gonna see something like a tendril dying off right near the stem, and you're gonna cut that fruit off using gardening shears with about an inch of the stem. You're gonna cut it off and harvest it. Then, you're gonna go in your kitchen and you're gonna cook it for dinner. The third thing you're gonna do is leave a comment below with a recipe that I need to try. Thanks for watching guys. I'll catch you next time.